God obviously brought it here. And um, we need to think about it. My message this morning is taken from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14. Ephesians 6, verse 14. We've already talked about the fact of standing firm. And just by way of introduction, Paul told the believers the, fo the following. He said, strengthening the souls of the disciples, Luke writing, encouraging them to continue in the faith, saying, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. This is not an easy road. And we've been talking about the fact that we have been actually been inundated with a cosmic darkness, spiritual darkness in high places, principalities and powers, and Satan. Now, the question raised to me last week, and I think it was a good one, what about weaker Christians? You're talking about being strong, and the implication was we've got to be strong. And what about those who are nearly saved and really don't know a lot of the Scriptures? How do they stand, and how do they do it? Turn with me to a passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Every born-again Christian is in this battle. If you're born again, you're going to have trouble. If you're born again, you're going to have temptations. If you're born again, the road is not going to be easy. It's going to be tough. But here's the promise that we have from God. No temptation or trial, you can put trial in there in the same way. No temptation or trial has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. So every trial you have, every trial I have, every trial the church collectively has is common. We're no different. We all face the same thing. We all have the same trials. We're not different. Sometimes people say to me, well, nobody has suffered like I, or nobody faces this particular problem. That is really, when you say that, it is the height of pride. Because the Bible says every trial you and I face is common to man. Somewhere, someone, somewhere is having or has had the same kind of trial you have had or I have had. We're not unique. And so he says there's every trial is common to man, and God is faithful. He does the same thing every time. He doesn't ever change a promise. He never reneges on his promise. He always faithfully carries out his problem, pro promise, excuse me, who will not allow you to be tempted or tried beyond what you are able. It might be a temptation to evil. It might be a trial that you are facing. And the Bible says that he will not allow you to go through any trial or temptation that, that uh, is beyond what you are capable of bearing. I don't know what's going on here, but it's getting worse. But <laughs> did Paul have to go through this, I wonder, when he preached? Anyway, back, meanwhile, back at the ranch, we be tempted, but, uh, but with the temptation, whatever that temptation is, it's not greater than what you and I can bear. Now, what we think we can bear and what we bear or can bear is two different things. So when you're in the midst of a trial or I'm in the midst of a trial, we know this, that it's a common trial, it's not unique. And we know this, that God is able, he's faithful, and he will not allow us to be tempted or go through this trial greater than we can bear. That's a guarantee. But with the temptation, he will provide the way of escape so that you may be able to endure it. He has a way of being able to cut this trial, this fight, this war we're in. He gives us a way of escape. And that's trusting God, leaning on him, holding fast. The Bible in the Psalms says, wait on the Lord. Just keep patiently waiting on him. 
trusting him, and going through it one day at a time. Don't heap all the trials and troubles of tomorrow onto today. God has given us the grace to trust him today and get us through it. And don't worry about tomorrow, Jesus said in Matthew 6, 34. He said, tomorrow has enough trouble of its own. Just take this day. Enjoy this day. And realize the victory of God this day. And when tomorrow comes, God will dish out the grace you need to get you through tomorrow. And I've told you many times before, when you add on tomorrow's trouble, you don't have grace for that. It turns your stomach, it makes you get ulcers, it gives you all kinds of heebie-jeebies. So the point is, trust him for today, make plans for tomorrow, realizing that God may have his own way of getting through them. You never know what to expect during the day. <clears throat> so we are to be reminded, however, the importance of the fact that we are in a battle and we are in a world that is anti-God, anti-church, anti-Jesus Christ. It hates it. That's why the Bible says, don't love the world. For anyone who loves the world, the love of the Father is not in me. We love our toys. We love our recreation. We love our freedom. We love all these things, and some of them are very worldly. I'm not talking about immorality necessarily. That is worldly too, but I'm talking about some good things. We place some good things above the Lord, and it becomes worldly, and we enjoy it, and we lost our first love in some cases. The believer should not spiritually drink the world's philosophy or mental hang-ups based on emotional feelings. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7 says this, Be of sober spirit. In other words, don't be drunk with what the world offers. I mean, in this particular pandemic, we've had everything from this side, conservative, ultra-conservative, to ultra-liberal in this, right? I can pick up my computer, and which I don't. I don't get on the web and read everybody says on the web. But you could get on the web and you read one over here and one over here and one over here, and you can stagger down the life like a drunk sailor. But this is the thing that keeps you steady on the road. This is truth. A lot of lies out there, and we would expect that. If the devil is in charge of the world, and he is, Jesus said he is a liar and the father of lies. We expect that. We don't expect the government to always tell us the truth, unless we're naive. We don't always expect our educational system to tell us the truth, unless we're naive, do we? No. You see the guarantees on television and the ads? Do you believe all of them are actually true? If you do, I got to land in Florida. They are not. We live in a world of lies. So sober means well-balanced, not staggering mentally or spiritually, not, re not working on the first impulse that comes. We go to God's word and we figure it out. We are to stand because it is a privilege to be on the side of God in this warfare, standing on the front lines <clears throat> and not retreating is worth it all. I pray, you know, I pray that I'm not on the back someplace just supporting it, and then the first sign of trouble comes, I run. I want to be... I want to be on the front line. I think of that story of Moses. Remember they ran out of water? Uh, they ran out of water and he hit the rock, remember that time? And they were ready to stone him. Did you bring us, Moses, out of Israel 
to come to this desert to die of thirst. And they were ready to stone him. That's their way of recalling a leader, as they stone him. And you know what God said? Go stand up before them. You get in front of that mob, and you speak the truth. He did that when they were, the Pharaoh's army was behind him, and the Red Sea was in front of him, and they were yelling and screaming and complaining again. What did God tell the leader? Moses. He told the people, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. I want to be that kind of person. And I think you do too. We don't want to give in to the devil's whims, either morally or physically or any other way or theologically. First, Second Timothy chapter 4, here's what Paul wants on his tombstone. Not that he ever got one. It says, I fought a good fight. I finished the course. I've kept the faith. I don't know what you want to put on my tombstone if I have one. He preached the word. That's all I care. That's all I care. It's not how many friends I've gained or how many people I've pleased. It's that I was faithful to God in preaching the word and standing on his word. That's the kind of stand God wants us to make in our lifetime. And the first thing we got to do is we got to remember this. We're not going to win the fight. You and I can't win this fight. We're in a battle that we'll lose if we stand on our own. We've got to have armor on that God gives us. Our logic our argumentation goes nowhere. But God's armor fits us to stand. First thing in his armor is having girded your loins with truth. Now, there's six pieces to this armor. There's the belt of truth. There's the breastplate of righteousness. There are the sandals of peace. There's the shield of faith. There's the helmet of salvation. And now we have the one offensive weapon, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So let these armor, this armor, is in a logical order. You put it on in the way that it is given by the Apostle Paul. The first piece in the equipment is the belt of truth, is the girding your loins with truth. The, the command to stand assumes that you have already girded <clears throat> yourself with truth. The Roman soldier at that time wore a girdle or a large belt around his waist. And uh, this was made of leather or woven leather. It was to tuck in loose clothes as they wear kilts, something like the Scottish people do when they went to battle. So they'd tuck it in so they're free to move. No loose clothing anywhere. Like a person running in track, take off all the stuff. You don't run with an overcoat in track. You don't run up with your normal clothing. You tuck it in so you have the least resistance that you can have. And uh, this belt would be underneath <coughs> his armor, and it would be also a place to tuck his weapons. When the soldier relaxed, he would take off the belt, but when the command came to stand, the first thing he'd do was to take that belt and tuck it up. You know, we use that expression occasion, don't we? Buckle up your belt. We're in for a ride. So there's something about buckling up your belt that gives you inner strength, inner confidence. It is that kind of assurance. I mean, it gives you that strength in the middle. So the belt of truth that God gives the Christian soldier is his inner strength and his uh, confidence, godly confidence. The noun is, says, a girding around your waist or your loins. Paul related this belt to truth. Now, when we talk about truth here, uh, I, commentators that I've read have gone two ways here. 
One is this is the objective truth of, of the Bible, the, what the church believes. We believe that God is one person, or one in essence, three in persons. We believe Christ to be the Son of God, the Son of Man. And you go through the doctrinal statement. That solid, basic truth, that objective truth called the faith, not the faith that you have in God, but the faith on which you stand. Another way the commentators have gone on this is that he picks it up from chapter 5, and it is to tell the truth, to be truthful. We don't deny that, but in light, to me, in light of the context here, you're talking about armor to stand. And if you're, you really believe the truth of the Word of God and you're confident in what God said and what he meant in God's word, you can stand, and the result of this, of course, is that you would be truthful. Truthful people come and speak truth regardless of how it might hurt. It comes from a solid foundation. They are based on the truth of the word of God. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, every Iwana kid should know this, be diligent to present yourself or study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed accurately handling the word of truth. You have to know the word of truth. The more you word of truth, the more truth is girded around your belt and in your truth. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 5. 2 Corinthians 10 Verses 3 to 5. Where we talk about this warfare. He says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Does that remind you of a verse we had? Our battle is not with flesh and blood. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculation and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. The word of God, the truth, known and believed by a believer gives us divine strength to do battle with the schemes of the devil. The demonic attacks come through philosophy, worldviews, or any other kind of teaching that minimizes, contradicts, <clears throat> or tries to eliminate the faith of a believer is able to be withstood when one has a knowledge of the truth of the Word of God. You're not, you're not shaken. You're not thrown away. That's why we meet together on Sunday mornings and we preach the Word of God or we teach the Word of God in Bible studies and we teach the Word of God in uh, Sunday school or Bible fellowship hour, small groups or whatever. We teach the Word of God. It's the Word of God that emboldens us and gives us the discernment to be able to tell what's way over here on the left or what's way over here on the right. It's the Word of God that sobers us up. It's the Word of God that keeps us clean. The foundational piece in the armor is not one's sincerity or their own truthfulness because the apostle has stated this is God's armor provided by God. God gives us the truth here. John, Jesus said in John 8, 32, you shall know the truth, and what does it say? The truth shall make you free. You want true freedom? Know the truth. We're talking about somebody that we know, Abe and I, we're talking about somebody we know that has bitterness. And they have a hard time forgiving 
the person that hurt them. And the way the person hurt them was they dominated their life or tried to, and uh, they resented that. Sad thing is, when you're bitter, you're still being dominated by the person that did dominate you. They're still affecting you. And one way to get freedom from that is forgive them. No matter what they did to you, forgive them. Some of you may have come from an abused background, and you're holding resentment there. Forgive them. You know, forgive them, whether they, they accept it or not, or whether they're in your life or not. Forgive them and move on. You shall know the truth, and the truth is you can forgive them, and the truth is you can go on. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6, 13, be on alert, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Be a, a man that you would picture the man, Christ Jesus. Now we all have our pictures of people. Some it's John Wayne as a man, some it's uh, Matt Dillon, and others whatever, you know, and you watch these things, they came in and they took charge. They were the men in the room. Now what, we have a greater man than that by far, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he was assaulted, he stood firm. He never backed down. And he was always loving, he was always kind, but when he had to be firm, he was firm. Listen to Matthew 23, what he said to the spiritual leaders of his day. You hypocrites! And he told people that were disobeying the word of God, they were going to hell. Everlasting destruction. Be strong. Which means that when we have this girdle of truth around us, we need to think biblically. We need to think biblically. <clears throat> this message keeps growing. Turn with me to James chapter 1. It's not in the notes. But here's what James chapter 1 says. After he's greeted... Uh, the people who are reading his letter, the 12 tribes who are dispersed all, all abroad. He says, greetings. Then the next thing he says, very interesting, James gets right down to the point. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when everything is going your way. Is that what he said? What did he say? Consider it joy, all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. So when a trial comes, do you and I immediately think it's joy? You know what we think? Oh, no. Can it get any worse than this? Woe is me. I'm the only one. Everybody loves God and everything going wrong in our life. I don't think that's considering it all joy. And how can you consider it all joy? How can you consider it all joy when everything's going wrong and every day is Monday? Take a look at the next line. My brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces what? Endurance. And let, don't shut it off, let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect, mature, and complete, lacking in nothing. Why does God send these trials? Why did God send COVID? Why did God do all these things? It is to build us up in the faith. It's to make us strong. That's why. And we know that. Or do we? Most of the people, Christians, that I deal with, not very many, 
Count it joy. Most count it, oh, get us out of this. Pray me out of this. Get this over with. I can't handle this. Well, didn't you just read? When you fall into temptations, no temptation will take you, but unless it's what? Common to who? To man. And God is able, and he will not tempt you above your able, but will with the temptation or trial make a way to escape. Now, the word temptation can go two ways in Greek. It can be a trial, depending on the context, or it can be a solicitation to evil. So some of you that are struggling with habits that you can't get rid of and just seem to plague you, you can get rid of it. You can break it with God's help. When the temptation comes to get into this habit, get into practicing this habit, you can, by the grace of God and the help of God, overcome it. He makes a way to escape. You don't have to fall prey to it. You can avoid it. So we need to take, think biblically. Look at 2 Corinthians 2.11 while you're looking up Scripture. Recognize how are we to think biblically. 2 Corinthians 2.11. Paul says, so that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. And here's what we're not ignorant of. <clears throat> the Bible says, Jesus said, Satan is the father of lies, and he is a liar. So whenever Satan comes to you, he brings a lie. The other thing we're not ignorant of, Satan is an angel of light. If you were to go in to his store and Satan was managing the counter, he would be sharp, he would appeal to your senses, he would appeal to your looks, he would appeal and say what you want to hear. But knowing Satan, you would know that even though he appears as a sharp, clean-cut person who knows his business, he's a liar. How many times have people bought stuff they didn't need and were tricked in buying it because of a slick salesman? You ever been guilty of that? I have. I was in seminary. If I'd have been sick a week, I'd have gone bankrupt. That's how close I lived to the edge, financially. I heard about seminary. They were talking about it in the social room. We had a room where we all gathered between class and argued and had a good time together, fellowshipping over the Word of God. And I heard that they were the, this filter queen, vacuum people, we're coming around and offering people five bucks. They give you five bucks to hear their sale pitch. Man, I could use five bucks. So I said, yes, come on over. This vacuum cleaner costs 350 bucks. And uh, <clears throat> he showed me this vacuum cleaner. I lived in a 50 by 10 trailer. We had a carpet that was probably from here to there. That's all the carpet we had in the house. And this guy gave me the pitch. He put down iron balls, and this vacuum cleaner would suck them up. Man, that impressed me. And he told me all the things that this would filter air. You just had to set it there, turn it on, sprinkle this little perfume in this filter, and it would, and it would spread air. Guess what? For five bucks, I bought a $350 vacuum cleaner for a 10 by 50 trailer. And I paid for that thing for a couple years, every month, more than five bucks. I was 
a sucker. You ever been there? That's what Satan does to Christians. He sells us stuff that we know better, yet because of his slickness, his attire, his angel of light, he can tell us a lie without even flinching. Now look at 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, very familiar verse. All Scripture is inspired by God, underline the word profitable, for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in instruction. Do you get it? For teaching, for reproof. You know what that is? Correcting wrong thoughts. For training of righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate, underline that word, equipped for every good work. Two things I want you to take out of there this morning, a lot of other things. But all Scripture is profitable, and all Scripture is adequate. All Scripture is adequate, including the last few chapters of Ezekiel. What does that talk about? Talks about the millennial kingdom. Talks about the sacrifices in the millennium. Is that profitable? I don't know. It is, somewhere, some way. If you believe God, then you believe it's profitable, right? You don't skim over it. You read it. Trusting God someday to bring it to pass. Thinking biblically means that the application of truth of the Bible must be applied to every facet of life. That is, a biblical world view. The current world and the national scene must be understood in the light of biblical prophecy. How much prophecy do you know? In the New Testament, a large portion of the New Testament is prophetical. The whole book of Revelation, 1st, 2nd Thessalonians, Matthew, the end of Christ's ministry, in the Gospels, he talks about the end times. He tells us what's going to happen. And does he say, Christian friend, it's going to get better and better? Is that what he says? No. Look at Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. Philippians 3, verse 20. Read it for yourself. Here Paul tells us our citizenship is in heaven from which we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm an American citizen. I'm glad I'm an American citizen. I treasure that. I'm proud, not in the wrong sense, but proud to be an American which is a nationalistic spirit, which God has created in every... I go to Brazil, and you know what? They're proud to be Brazilians. They love Brazil. I go to... Uh, I've been to Honduras. They're proud to be Hondurans. I've been to Venezuela. They're proud to be Venezuelans. I've been to Israel. They're proud to be Israel. I've been to Germany. They're proud to be Germans. But you know where my true citizenship is? It's in heaven. I'm an ambassador here, 1 Corinthians 5, 20. We are ambassadors. You know what ambassador is? We represent another country. We're not technically under the laws of this country, even though while we're here, we're to be good guests and obey the government as much as we can obey them. We're guests. In 2 Peter chapter 2, 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12, we read this. Beloved, I urge you as aliens. What's an alien? Someone from somewhere else. 
We think of them from some other planet. But they're, they're from somewhere else. They're aliens. And strangers to abstain from the flesh which wage, wage against the soul. We're strangers here. Now, I know what that's like. I went to a church where about everybody, when I grew up, everybody was related somehow or another. And we spent on Sunday afternoons, now who is your father's father and who was his wife's wife? And we go through all the genealogies to figure out where we might be related. And you know, I found out I had fourth cousins, fifth cousins, sixth cousins, and cousins that could be removed. <laughs> now, brand new person comes into church. Here's what I heard. Who's the Englishman that came to church? We made them feel like aliens and strangers. And what's really neat is you can go to Brazil and you can go to these countries and you sit down with believers and you can't always understand what they're singing or saying or preaching, but you realize your brothers, you realize your brothers and sisters with them. So he says, you're aliens and strangers. And then he says in verse 12, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles so that in living in which, you, which they slander you as evildoers, super spreaders, that may, be, that may because of your good deeds as they observe them glorify God in the day of visitation. If we behold, behold if we behave ourselves, listen, if we behave ourselves excellent among the Gentiles, even in this COVID time, even in this troubling time, we can see believers come to Jesus Christ rather than cursing the darkness. Who brought the darkness? So-called. <clears throat> I want to tell you something, folks. We had a discussion in our Sunday school about this very thing, and I told them as part of the sermon, so they're not shocked. We may be disappointed in the election. Some people think our current president will overthrow the election. God may have it that way, but God may not. Either way, are you going to be happy? Daniel 4 says, God puts whoever he wants as king, even the worst, right? Read it, 417. Read 435 of Daniel on your own. Check it out. So, okay, a government comes in. Let's just say they come in and they take us, undo everything that we got to enjoy the last four years. Are you going to be happy? What's God's will? Do you want God's will? Yeah, you do, don't you, or do you? Or are you saying, I don't really know if I want God's will? Well, I'm going to tell you something. If I read my Bible correctly, you're going to have God's will, whether you want it or you don't. We have a sign on our refrigerator, used to have it, so it ain't home sweet home. Adjust. Listen, friend, you can enjoy this and you can be a profitable Christian, or you can be. You've got to think biblically here. Because I'm here to tell you, we're moving toward the second coming of Jesus Christ. Somebody said it could be a thousand years from now. It could be. But I can tell you right now, none of us are going to be here if it's a thousand years from now. You and I have a short term on earth whether the Lord comes or not. You and I have a short term. And we need during these few years, if we're going to be standing strong and we're going to be firm, then we need to think biblically here. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. God is going to destroy 
Every nation on earth. Every nation on earth. With the exception of Israel. And there, and God's going to work them over in judgment. There's not going to be one nation other than those named <clears throat> like Egypt, Edom and some of them, that will go into the millennium, but they will be overworked. Revelation 19, 11, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. His clothes, he is, he is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. John 1, 1 to 3. And the armies which are in heaven clothed in linen and white and clean, were following him on white horses. That's every believer in this age. I'll be on one of those horses. And if you're a believer, you'll be on one of those horses. And you'll be dressed white and clean linen, and you'll have no sword. Yet you're going into battle. From his mouth, verse 15, comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. Kind of interesting here, he, he, he treads a winepress. You know what that is? You put the grapes in it, take off your shoes, and you march through that grapes, and you crush out the wine, the juice out, and it goes somewhere else. That is pictured as Jesus walking on the nations, crushing all the blood out of all the nations. <clears throat> nations have rejected God since their inception in Babylon with Nimrod. God has put up with sin after sin after sin after sin, generation after generation, generation after generation. And finally, he's full of wrath. And he empties it out on the nations that exist. And if he came today, the United States of America would be wiped out by the word of his mouth if, it, if he came today. I don't know. He might come today. He might come tomorrow. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's either your judge or he's your Savior. Now think about this. God is moving all nations steadily toward judgment and destruction. <clears throat> Not going to get better. The only way it gets better temporarily is if you have a revolution or a civil war. <clears throat> There's never been a revival that takes a nation out from the cesspool of sin like we're in. When you gird yourself with the truth, you have removed doubt. It creates a settled conviction holds your mind together, and it grants stability in a time of unease. The understanding of God's purpose and plan gives sincerity and truthfulness to the person who's girded with the truth. And what you see should not shock us. Oh my, we may have to go underground like they did in London. That will not be a shock. Don't be shocked at the fiery trials that shall try you, Peter said in his epistle. 
I'm encouraging you, get into the Word. Take your stand. Enjoy your day. Rejoice in the trials that you have because you know God and you know he'll keep you through it. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Yea, even though I walk through the valley of sh the shadow of death, what? Thou art with me. Thou art with me. Let's be like Daniel. Let's be like the three friends of Daniel. Let's be like Moses. Let's be like those in Hebrews chapter 11. By faith they conquered. By faith they moved ahead. So I'm looking forward to the days ahead. <clears throat> Are you? You know why I'm looking forward to it? Because God the Son loves his church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's stand for prayer. Oh, Father, we're a sorry lot. Forgive us for our complaints. Forgive us for our doubts. Forgive us for our worries. Let us turn to you in faith and believing and be an army that stands firm in the face of the devil, of the God of this age, the prince and power of the air. Father, you've given us all the equipment. You've given us the strength. You've given us the wisdom in your word. Help us, Father, to take advantage of it. Help us to confess our sins of weakness and our sin of doubt and all these sins that cloud us and take us away from the wonderful person of Jesus Christ and who and what he is. Help us to stand and be firm in the spreading of the gospel this week. Telling people the good news in spite of all the bad news. The good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Help us to be faithful. In that we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.